Question 21. Jones Davenport submits a sell order for 12 contracts with a limit price of 25.7. So when we're limiting on a sell order, this means this is the minimum price that we'll accept. The market's limit order book immediately prior to Davenport's order is as follows. Uh, so we've got, um, since we're selling, we're gonna be looking at the bid, the bids, um, since the bids will be the buyers of our sell. Davenport's average trade price is closest to. So we're selling 12 contracts with a limit of 25.7, so we need to kind of determine how many of these are, will get executed and then what they get executed at. So we've got um, minimum uh, that we're willing to accept is 25.7. So essentially anything above this line, so any orders for 25.6 will not get executed. Um, so we can basically just cross this off right away. Don't consider it in the analysis. So now we have two contracts at 25.7. So we'll be buying or we'll be selling there and we'll be selling seven contracts at 25.8. Um, so we won't execute all 12 of our contracts. We're only going to get filled on nine of them. Um, so how we then calculate the average trade price is we just do the weighted average between those two prices. So seven of our nine contracts that we sold got executed at 25.8, which is this first part here. And then we add the um, weighted average of the other part. So two of the nine contracts got executed at 25.7. Uh, multiply that out, add them together, we get 25.7778, um, which we can best round to answer B. Question 22. You're planning to invest $3.5 in a certain project. Incremental net cash flows are expected to be $350,000 per year in perpetuity. The project's MPV, given a discount rate of 7%, is most likely. So we don't need to use our calculator, um, our cash flows on the calculator for this question we can use a more simple formula. So in this case, um, our net present value is gonna be that when we have a perpetual cash flow, it's gonna be our initial investment. So the cash flow at zero, which is gonna be minus 3.5 million, which is what we have here. And then we're gonna add that to that cash flow in perpetuity divided by the discount rate. Um, so our cash flow in perpetuity is gonna be that 350 number. Um, and then our discount rate will be the 7%. So we have 350 over 7%, add that to the 3.5 million or minus 3.5 million. And we get 1.5 million as our project's net present value corresponds to answer A. Question 23. The exhibit illustrates a market standing limit order book at market close. The market's bid and ask are closest to so when we're looking at this limit order book, we're gonna be looking at the tightest spread as basically the bid ask, because those are the first um, orders that will get filled. So on the bid side, that is going to be, um, when you look at it this way, so the bid side, this is what I, we are selling at. So when we're selling at the bid, we're gonna be taking the highest number first so as long as my bid, as long as my sell is not over four for the bid, I'm going to be selling at this price. So the highest bid will be our um, the market bid ask, and then opposite on the other side. So on the ask, I'm buying in this instance. So I want to buy at the lowest limit price that another that the that the dealer or broker on the other side is offering. Um, so as long as my order for buying is not over this 10 for ask, I'll be executed here. So basically we for we take the best bid and offer for our market price. Um, so we're gonna have a bid at 65 and ask at 67. Answer B. Question 24. While identifying the target market during the process of index construction, which of the following is the most appropriate determining factor? A, investment universe, Yes, this is going to be very important um, for an index because it's going to end up being the um, telling you kind of what exposure that index is targeting. Um, so this sounds like it could probably be our answer. Let's make sure we can rule out B and C. B, the broadest definition of a market segment. Um, we're not always going to want the broadest definition of a market segment. 
we, depending on what we're targeting for our target market, we might want something pretty broad or we might want something pretty narrow. We might want to only be looking at a specific sector or some group of companies based on a tip, a uh, characteristic, um, like how they make money or their growth rate or something else like that. Um, so we're not always going to want the broadest definition. We may want to be narrow based on the investments we want to be um, looking at. C, allocation to specific securities included in the index. Um, so this is tough. This could be definitely be our answer, and it ends up being important um, because this is going to be that end exposure that we have. Um, but when looking at the, the target market as a part of the index construction, this is going to be at the end um, and kind of not as important for this specific part of the process, which is determining that target market. Um, so I think A is the best answer. Investment universe is going to be the most important factor there. Question 25. The exhibit below illustrates the details concerning an equity index. The price return of the index is closest to. We've got a uh, little over 3%, a little over 4%, and over 12 so for price return, um, what we're going to need to do to calculate this is we're going to take the, we need to find out beginning period price, beginning of period price, and then figure out end of period price. And then um, we can figure out that return there. So for beginning of period price, what we can do is, and not, not uh, look at these dividends. We need to ignore that because that's going to mess up our price return. We'll include dividends for total return, uh, but price return, we just want to know end price, um, beginning price. Um, so one way to do this is we can just add up all the prices of all the securities and what it's worth in the beginning, which is kind of, which is how I went about it. So we'll take beginning of period price, 15.5, multiply that by the shares outstanding, uh, which is what we have here. That's what that corresponds to. And then we'll take 25 times 1,000, uh, 128 times 1,000, and then 200 times 2,000. So we do all that in this uh, part up here, and that gives us 569, 569,000. And then for end of period price, we're gonna do the same thing. So we're gonna do 13 times the number of shares, and then 22 times the number of shares, and down the line. We do that out, we get 641,000. So then for that price return, again, we ignore the dividends and we can just do that 641 divided by 569 minus one gives us 0.1265 or 12.65%. Answer C. Question 26. Samson Electrics, a Dutch component manufacturer, has issued 3.2% non-callable, non-convertible, perpetual preferred shares with a par value of 1,000. The credit rating provided by Standard Poor's is a AA minus, and the required return on identically rated preferred shares is 5.8%. The intrinsic value of the preferred share is closest to. So um, preferred shares intrinsic value formula is pretty straightforward. It's gonna be this first line up here. So the value of preferred shares is gonna be the dividend um, divided by the required rate of return. So required rate of return, we're given right here at 5.8%. And then the dividend, we will calculate by the coupon multiplied by the par value. So we'll do 3.2% times 1,000, which is what we get right here. Um, brings us to 32. And then we'll divide that 32 by that required rate of return, 0 0.058. Gives us 55 uh, 551.7241, and that rounds best to answer A. Question 27. A refinery company is going through some liquidity issues. To deal with the situation, the chief financial officer of a company is exploring ways to benefit from stretching its payables for 15 days. The average payables of the company aggregate is 875000 The company incurs a borrowing cost of 6.5%. The cost of extending the payables for 15 days is closest to. So essentially, to extend these payables for 15 days, we're going to need to borrow money. Um, so we're borrowing at 6.5%, and this is going to be an annualized number. We're borrowing at 6.5% annualized on this 875000 but we're only doing it for 15 days. 
So we're, what we're gonna do is multiply these two numbers together, and then we need to prorate this out for 15 days um, to get that actual cost. So let me pull this in and show you what that looks like. So we're gonna do 0 0.065 times the 875,000 to get our annualized borrowing costs. And then to prorate that, we simply just do 15 divided by 365, which will uh, prorates that amount that we're borrowing to just those 15 days. So that brings us to 2337.3288, and we can best round that to answer A. Question 28. A company plans to invest $7 million in a project. The project is expected to produce incremental net cash flows of $525,000 per year in perpetuity. If the company's opportunity cost of capital is 8.5%, then the net present value of the project is closest to. All right, so we had this question or a similar question earlier as well. So the formula we end up looking at is we're going to have minus $7 million on this project. And then when we have cash flows in perpetuity, um, we're going to add minus $7 million to $525,000, and we're going to divide that by the, the discount rate or the cost of capital, which is 0 0.085. So let's pull that in, and we can see what that answer looks like. So we've got that initial investment, cash flow at zero, minus $7 million. That's our investment. And then we're going to add that to the cash flow in perpetuity divided by the discount rate. Uh, so 525 over 0 0.085, and when we add those together, we get minus 823529 and some change, uh, which corresponds to answer B. And just to note, since this is negative, um, we would ideally the company would not take on this project if they haven't already made the investment. Question 29. Which of the following working capital management approaches most likely involves holding large positions in cash, receivables, and inventories relative to sales? So if we're holding large positions of cash, receivables, and inventories, these are all um, current assets. And holding large positions in them kind of um, implies that we have a lot of uh, liquidity. So what this does is it provides a lot of um, liquidity for short, meeting short-term and unexpected expenses. Pro it typically provides a firm good financial flexibility. Um, if there's kind of unforeseen events that come about, then we have a lot of cash or, on hand, or money potentially coming in that we can kind of use to cover unexpected expenses. Um, however, these are typically unproductive assets, so tying up a lot of money in those assets typically limits growth a little bit. So that's kind of the trade-off there. So if we're holding large amount of current assets, um, we're looking at A, moderate approach, B, aggressive approach, or C, conservative approach. This is gonna to correspond to a conservative, conservative approach um, since we're kind of prioritizing that financial stability um, over high growth. Aggressive approach B would be kind of the opposite, holding smaller amounts of um, current assets and making sure the uh, that our assets are tied up more in um, uh, higher growth opportunities, essentially. So that's what that aggressive approach would look like. And then for C, A, moderate, there'd be some kind of combination of the two, um, holding less in cash receivables inventory, but not as to the extent of being as aggressive. Answer C. Question 30. Smith Richards is an equity analyst following the stock of Horizon Limited, a company in the telecommunications sector. The company's balance sheet for the year 2016 is presented below. Richards aims to ascertain whether Horizon stock is fairly valued. The company has 5,000 shares outstanding, which are trading on the market at a price of 2050. So we've got our price here, and we're trying to figure out whether the stock is fairly valued. So if we determine the stock is we think the stock is worth $30, we would say this is undervalued. If we think it's worth 10 or some number below 2050, then we would say it's overvalued. And then we've got some financial information here. So it looks like we've got um, balance sheet assets and uh, some liabilities and equity. Uh, with the exclusion of next net fixed assets, the market value of all assets and liability are equal to their book values. The market value of net fixed assets is 1.5 times its book value. So that's gonna be this line item here. And then based on Horizon's, Horizon Limited's book value per share, Richards will most likely, most likely conclude that its stock is. 
over, under, or failure, fairly valued. So we're gonna be looking at book value per share and then we'll be comparing that to 2050. And so book value per share is gonna be the difference between market value of assets and liabilities. So we're told that market value of assets is gonna be are equal to book value. So we're given those book values and then 1.5 times book value for um, net fixed assets. And then we're gonna divide that by the shares outstanding, which we were given at 5,000. So let me pull in the table. We can walk through all that. So like I said, book value per share is gonna be market value of assets minus market value of liabilities, and then divide that by shares outstanding, which we're given. So market value of assets, we're gonna have 3,500. So the cash, accounts receivable, 25,000 uh, right here, 4,300 in inventory. So like we said, those are equal to book value and then the market value of net fixed assets is 1.5 times 45. So that uh, is reflected here and that gives our assets an overall number of just over 100,000. Our market value of liabilities, a little more straightforward. Uh, we've got accounts payable, notes payable, and then equity. Um, so the only two line items we'll include here are accounts and notes payable. So we've got market value of liabilities at 12,600 plug those into the book value per share formula, um, which gives us 100,300 minus 12,600, and then divide that by shares outstanding. So we've got 17.54. And then going back to what we said earlier, <coughs> if we think the stock is worth less than this, then we um, believe that the market is overvaluing it. So we would want to either not buy that stock or short the stock. So we will choose answer A, overvalued.